Let's go. All right. What's up, y'all? Let's go. All right. Okay. Come What's up, y'all? Let's go. Hold on. Oh, man. Let me turn down this volume. All Yo, all right, there we go. All right, we're live, yo. All right, what's up, y'all? Let's go. Can you hear me? Let me know if you can hear me. Let me know if my mic is good. Um, y'all, okay, so today, uh, yeah, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me because I'm running off OBS today and I'm trying something new. So um, we're seeing if this works, seeing how it goes. So today we're covering, uh, today we're doing a little day streaming. It's called a little day streaming. We're doing a little day streaming, you guys. And we're doing... We're doing uh, Led Zeppelin, Stairway to Heaven. So I thought we would start a new little mini-series here. And shouts out to based homeschool mom, Rachel Wilson, who came up with this idea. Um, she uh, texted me and said, you know, you ought to think about doing some music lyrics. I think that'd be cool. And I was like, yeah, I can't believe that that's... Thank you so much. That's a brilliant idea. So, yeah. So we're doing a little... Um, we're doing a little mini-series here. Uh, we're going to see how far it goes, but we're going to start by doing... What I thought came to mind first, which is um, uh, if we're going to talk about music lyrics, then we might as well start with uh, the song, right, which is Stairway to Heaven. We're doing Led Zeppelin, Stairway to Heaven. And so we're, what we're going to do is we're going to, obviously we can't play the song here. We'll get popped in, in a millisecond, totally nuked. So but that's the way it is with everybody, right? So what we're going to do is um, we're going to talk about the music lyrics. We're going to... Um, look at the text. We're going to actually discuss the lyrics, talk about some of the, the uh, esoteric symbolism uh, in the song. As you know, I mean, everybody knows Led Zeppelin. If you don't know Led Zeppelin, you know, then um, you probably have, you know, I'm, I, everybody knows Led Zeppelin. And we're going to be looking at some of the occult and esoteric symbolism in the lyrics. As you know, there's a whole range, there's a wide range of things that apply um, to this song and that this song has sort of fostered you know, all the legends, all the lore and all that stuff. So we're going to look at the actual text of the lyrics and we're going to also be diving into some uh, biographical text because this is Bayes Lit Analyzer. We're talking about literature. So we're going to look at some of the some of the biographical um, and literary material about Led Zeppelin, uh, namely from the definitive sources and the definitive sources. Now, I'm not saying that these are I'm not saying they're trustworthy or not trustworthy. I'm just saying they're the definitive sources, and that's what we have to go off of, right? So uh, we're going to be starting with um, Hammer of the Gods by Stephen Davis. This is um, the definitive biography of Led Zeppelin. Then we're going to look at a really interesting book, which is uh, Richard Cole's Stairway to Heaven. This is Richard Cole's biography. He was the uh, road manager for Led Zeppelin. He's got some interesting things to say. And we're not necessarily talking about, like, you know, this isn't like— uh, you know, we're not going to be doing like uh, Spurg out fandom. We're talking about, um, you know, going back into the source material, looking at some of the literature to decide and to discuss and sort of make conclusions about the sources for the song, uh, Stairway to Heaven, the inspiration, um, Led Zeppelin's um, dark lore, Jimmy Page's um, OTO, dark uh, Crowleyan rituals, which are mentioned in the book. And what I'm going to do is, you know, of course I'm going to be... Uh, you know, interpreting this and having an opinion on it, of course. Uh, but we, as usual, we're going to be looking at the source material and talking about the things that have actually been said. Because again, with a lot of this stuff, um, people can get lost in terms of like, you know, they can start to make up their own history of things. Um, so, and, and I'm not, you know, whatever. I'm just saying, let's just go back into the book and see what we find, right? Um, and I've also got some, a book about, Led Zeppelin's, this is the story behind every song. So I've got Led Zeppelin's, um, uh, some, some, some more information about Stairway to Heaven. And of course, I'm going to be going over some of the music. And so let's start with Led Zeppelin 4. Okay, we're starting with, I call it 4. Now, you may be watching this and like, you know, if you're a Led Zeppelin head, that's, that's cool. And look, disclaimer, you know, I love Led Zeppelin. I, I'm, a, I'm a fan. I'm a huge fan of Led Zeppelin. I know their music extremely well, very well. Uh, they Led Zeppelin 2 was the first CD that I ever owned. 
Uh, I remember listening to them for the first time when I was very young because my dad had all the records, and I actually have them here. In fact, this is the record that that my dad, you know, this is my dad's old record. Shouts out to Pops. And, uh, and I remember listening to this record so many times, you know, back when I, I'm not old enough to, like, have been listening to records, but he had records, and, um, and I would put that on and listen to it. I remember being at friends' houses, and they had it and listening to it, you know, when I was really young. And then, you know, I had the tapes, and then when, the C- when CDs, I remember I am old enough to know when CDs first came out and hit it big. And Led Zeppelin II was my first uh, CD that I ever owned. I got it for Christmas when I was in fifth grade. And here's Led Zeppelin IV. This is the uh, this is the original album. I don't I don't I have all of my dad's records. Thankfully, you know, I mean, he gave me all of his his uh, records from from the time. So this was bought at the time, right? This is from the early seventies. It's not like a reissue or whatever. Not that it matters. Um, but I, I tend to listen to music, you know, like everybody else digitally, and I have a lot of CDs and stuff. But I do love having the records from the old, from the time. And this is the original uh, Led Zeppelin IV record. I call it Four. And you see this old man on the front, right? You see this old man. He reminds me of uh, he reminds me of Heidi's granddad carrying, you know, carrying this bundle of sticks on his back. And you know, look at him. He's just he's just chilling there. Look at him. Look, he's just he's walking there. He's got to get to firewood. And then you've got, of course, on the you see that it's a picture within a broken wall. It's this broken down old wall. And then on the back, of course, you have dreary 70s brutalist post blitz architecture. But what's interesting, you guys will find interesting, is when you open up the record, right? On the inside, of course, you get this is the original artwork on the inside. And what is this? Well, this ties, I'm not just showing you this for like, you know, to, to you know, spurg out or something. I'm showing you this because this ties into the meaning of the song. And of course, Led Zeppelin in general, we have these craggly rocks here. Um, some say you could say you can see devil's hoof uh, footprints uh, within this. You've got this walled city down here, right? Covered in snow with the zo- sort of a zozo zigzag. You've got light right from behind the dark mountain. And then of course, what do you have? You have, that is, the hermit, that's the hermit tarot. And notice that he's got the, what does he have inside there? He's got the hexagonal, or he's, he's got the uh, hexagram, right? He's got a, I don't know, would that be an inter- intercursal uh, um, hexagram, Crowleyan? I'm not sure, but we do have the, uh, the hermit tarot, right? And anybody who's seen uh, Led Zeppelin's Song Remains the Same, right? The film, which in my opinion is the greatest rock film of all time. I mean, look, look, whatever you think about Led Zeppelin, you know, the music, you know, the music is amazing. I mean, <laughs> and these guys, you know, played at Madison Square Garden uh, for a couple nights and each of the concerts, of course, for Song Remains the Same, each of the concerts was, you know, two and a half, three hours long. And you can't deny that they go on stage and give their all. I mean, they play the shit out of this place. They play the fuck, excuse me, I know it's a day, it's a day stream, excuse my language, but they play the hell out of this place, probably literally the hell out of it, right? Or the hell into it, I don't know. Um, and, of course, at the end of that concert, you'll remember that, uh, for, from the film, that they were robbed. Uh, they, they stored, they carried cash, all their money was carried in cash by Peter Grant, who was, who, you know... Uh, shouts out to Jay. He's doing a stream tonight with Jamie on um, on Elvis, and we you know we've covered Elvis, of course, and uh, Colonel Parker's mob ties, and you know Jay has written about this extensively, and Dave McGowan, and and that of course there are mob ties within the uh, music industry, and that doesn't stop. You know Led Zeppelin is no exception to that. In fact, they're probably one of the biggest examples of that. Um, later on in their tours, uh, John Bonham's John Bonham became best. You know really good friends with this guy, John Binden. Uh, John Binden uh, was one of their road managers. Uh, well, Richard Cole was their road manager. He was one of their main roadies, though, and sort of bodyguards. And John Binden was known as a uh, as a wide boy. He was a London gangster, right? We're going to go hang out with Led Zeppelin, got a call, got a ring from, from Peter Grant. Peter Grant was the manager. He is the rock manager. In fact, you know... That's what, you know, sort of Spinal Tap, the movie Spinal Tap is sort of based on Led Zeppelin's antics. And Peter Grant fits this sort of archetype of the Colonel Parker, uh, Suge Knight, 
huge, hulking, looming manager who takes a huge cut of everywhere that they play. Um, he was notorious for, you know, look, if Led Zeppelin's going to play somewhere, um, they are going to take a huge percentage of the door and there's not going to be any merchandise that they are not a part of. And he was, you know, he was really, he was physical with people uh, to get that. And of course, the other thing you may not realize about Zeppelin is I, I discussed in one of the last streams about how, you know, in the music industry, I'm not like an expert in the music industry, but I have friends who worked in the mu music industry. And one of the things that people know this, everybody sort of knows this, is that, you know, bands, musicians don't really make money from record contracts, right? They, they get a huge record contract. And of course, that's a lot of money, especially for, for musicians who come from nowhere, right? Um, I mean, look at Elvis, right? That's the reason why Graceland is so gaudy because Elvis came from nowhere and he spent all his money ostentatiously on all this stuff. Um, but the record, the record, the, the record company will take a huge percentage of the money that they pay you in the contract. You got to pay out managers. You got to pay out the studio. The studio is expensive. You got to pay out your, your PR, your publish, all these people, right? So really, uh, musicians make money from touring and Led Zeppelin was, you know, again, no exception. I mean, Jimmy Page produced all of their music. They wrote all their own music. They owned the licensing and publishing for all their music, but they, they weren't really a, you know, a, a, like a top 10 radio pop band, right? We, we, there's kind of a misconception about that. I mean, Stairway to Heaven is, is usually considered the number one rock song of all time, right? And Led Zeppelin 4, as I call it, you know, four symbols or untitled, but I call it four. It's the fourth album. Uh, Led Zeppelin's 4 um, is one of the best-selling albums of all time. You know, it was on the Billboard uh, Top 100 for, you know, I don't know, 30. It's probably still there. It's probably still there, right? Uh, since the early 70s, kind of like Dark Side of the Moon and all that. But, um, but that being said, uh, they still made all of their money from touring. And one of the things you may not realize about Zeppelin is that unlike other bands, Led Zeppelin always played alone. They rarely had openers and they, they certainly didn't open for other bands. Um, even at the start of their career, I mean, they, they did at the very start, they would open for a couple other bands, but they quickly became a band that only played. It was just them. You went to go see just them. There was no opener. They played the entire show, which I think is pretty unique even today. Right. If you go to a concert, you're going to see an opening band or an opening act. And Peter Grant made sure that wasn't the case. Back to John Binden before we get into lyrics. John Binden was a wide boy, a gangster, right, in the East End in London. He was um, an associate of the Crays, right, the Cray Twins. Uh, there's a movie about the Cray Twins with Tom Hardy that's pretty good if you haven't seen that. But the Crays were notorious London gangsters who were also loosely associated with the mafia in the United States, but the Crays sort of ran London, you know, they, they, you know, any, any Brits watching or, or even Crispy, you know, in the old country will know about the Crays, of course. Um, and one interesting thing about John Binden is that one of the times when John Bonham and Peter Grant were arrested in the late seventies was because, um, a, someone backstage at a concert was mistreating, or at least they were mishandling uh, or, or maybe even just speaking rudely to Peter Grant's son, um, John Binden caught this and uh, they, they uh, gave the guy who did this, uh, uh, they put him in critical condition. He and John Bonham and Peter Grant. And John Binden was, of course, no stranger to violence. I mean, he was a violent gangster. But what's interesting about John Binden is that, yes, he was mafia connected. Yes, he was connected to Peter Grant. But he also had an affair with Princess Margaret, if you didn't know that. Uh, he, when Princess Margaret went, um, went off to, I think, Jamaica, uh, she took John Binden along and they had a notorious affair. And MI, uh, MI5 ended up following him around and he died a early death of natural causes. Um, so that's an interesting story. But uh, Led Zeppelin was certainly no stranger to uh, dangerous characters and the, and the dangerous world of uh, media and after the concert at Madison Square Garden, at which they filmed the, um, at which they filmed uh, the song remains the same over a couple nights, they carried all their money in cash. They put they stored their money in the hotel, uh, the Plaza Hotel's um, uh, safety deposit box. They went. Richard Cole went back to retrieve it, and the safety deposit box had been 
jimmied open and there was no money in it. They were missing like $250,000. That's how much they got paid for this concert. And when they quit, you know, he was questioned by the police about this, of course. And he said basically that, you know, the money was for uh, expenses, which includes obviously uh, drugs, sex, drugs, cars, and their airplane. Led Zeppelin was one of the first bands. You know, Elvis had the Lisa Marie and private jets. Um, and Zeppelin was really the, the, the band besides the Rolling Stones um, that started this sort of trend of the big time rock star having their own, uh, having their own um, ship. Their first one um, was called the, uh, was it called the Starship? And their second one, their second, it was seven, 747, big, way bigger than Elvis's. It was an actual 747 jet. And their second one was called Caesar's Chariot. Um, and so they questioned him about this and that the, I, I would assume my opinion about this is that probably that uh, Richard Cole was, he was not trusted by Peter Grant after this and he probably used the money to pay off dealers and the mob and let them know where the money was. The money was, of course, insured um, and probably took a cut of the money. I mean, allegedly, I don't know, um, but probably took a cut of the money um, that they stole and then the money was recouped to the band through insurance. Um, so... Um, Let's get into Led Zeppelin, um, the song, um, uh, Stairway to Heaven. And I'm going to be looking at the lyrics through um, this book right here, which I got when I was about 12 years old. And it's actually a, it's actually a book of tablature. It's a, red, a Led Zeppelin old tablature book um, for guitar. So I'm just going to take you through some of the lyrics and discuss them. <coughs> and, um, and before I get going, yeah, please, everybody, thank you for being here. Really appreciate y'all being here on this uh, weekday, weekday afternoon lunchtime stream. Um, hope it's coming through okay. If if the you know, I hope the mic and the volume and the and the way that we look here is coming through because I'm on OBS. So, you know, and and yes, and shouts out to uh, West Lexicon Media, West Lex, who will be on with tonight at 6 p.m. discussing the amazing 1987 film. Uh, Belly of an Architect, which you, you may not have seen. Uh, it's a Peter Greenaway film. We got a lot to say about this movie, you guys. It's going to be really fun. And shouts out to Wes Lex because he made our intro today. Please um, support Wes Lex by going to ACR, Alternate Current Radio, with Hesher and Spore and all those OGs, and also to um, his Instagram where he makes amazing videos, video edits, and he threw that one together for me real quick. I mean... You know, I really appreciate it. That was really cool. So thank you so much. We also got another um, intro video that our homegirl Ellie did for me. And I just, I'm such a Wittarto when it comes to tech. I got to fill up, uh, figure out how to pull up the file. And that one's a longer um, intro. And I'll be putting that in if I can figure it out. So shouts out to Ellie out there. Appreciate you too. Thank you to Wes Lex. Thank you to everybody. And please, before I get started, um, look at the links in the video description and then the uh, channel description. And please support me so that I can uh, continue doing this. I'm going to, like I always say, I'm going to keep doing it anyway because I love doing this. But um, I love doing this. Need to get some equipment. So thank you so much. And please support me. And I'll give you a shout out. All right. So let's look at Stairway to Heaven. All right. So here are the lyrics. Okay. And I'm going to take you through it and give commentary on the lyrics and analysis. There's a lady who's sure all that glitters is gold and she's buying a stairway to heaven. Right. So the, the song begins... Obviously, everybody's heard this song. And forgive me if this sounds a little elementary, but let's let's take us through it, okay? Um, the song begins, right, with this solo guitar note, which is one of the most recognizable notes in music history. And we have a we have the the guitar and we have which becomes the accompaniment for uh, Robert Plant's vocals. And then we have the introduction of this sort of is it a Mellotron? I think it's a Mellotron that comes in, played by John Paul Jones. And then later on in the song, we have like one of the most famous, you know, drum intro fills of all time, uh, played by John Henry Bonham. And I can't really speak to the uh, the Devil's Trireme or whatever it is, um, and the 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 three corded uh, notes of the song. I'm not, uh, you know, I, I'm not really. Uh, that's not my area. Uh, maybe we can talk to our. Uh, you can you can ask Jeff about that. Jeff is our resident. Um, um, guitar expert. He's an amazing guitar player. But I'm just going to really speak about the lyrics and in general about the song. So it begins with, the song is about a lady, right? Who is the lady? Who is the lady in this song? Well, I think she's both the May Queen, 
which is later mentioned in the song. And also she's uh, sort of the Sophia principle, right? This is a, we're, we're getting into Gnostic territory here. And she's going, all that glitters is gold. She's sure that all that glitters is gold. We know that all that glitters is not gold, but what's glittering, we can't help but think of what's glittering and she's buying us, she's buying, she's purchasing a stairway to heaven, right? Meaning that um, the character here uh, and the speaker, the speaker is discussing how one can purchase one's way into heaven, which we know is false, obviously is totally ridiculous, bullshit. But um, it reminds me of, I couldn't help but think of the Borgias, right? <clears throat> of, well, who was it? Pope Alexander VI. Uh, I might be wrong about that, but I think it's Pope Alexander VI and the Borgias and this, you know, sort of, yes, we've talked about um, simony in, uh, Don in Dante's Inferno and the Borgias are, are even placed down there. But we have this pope who purchases his his papacy, and we have the, I guess the the Gnostic idea of of transcending or purchasing uh, one's one's way into, or or rather shedding uh, one's temporal form, right to experience uh, gnosis or enlightenment. Yes, um, or in a straight up. Uh, satanic paradigm, this would be uh, selling one's soul, right? Purchasing, purchasing um, the, all the cities of the earth and the princes and principalities um, by buying a heaven of temporal pleasure, right? Not right. I'm not saying I agree with that, obviously. I'm saying that's an interpretation of the song. Fuck that, right? Okay, but excuse my language. Um, when she gets there, she knows if the stores are all closed, with a word, she can get what she came for, right? In other words, uh, this this the speaker is saying that you say the magic word, right? You say abracadabra, uh, abracadabra, and you remember abracadabra is the final word of the prestige, right? And we think of obviously Crowley, and you know abracadabra has become sort of a byword for magic, but it, uh, I think it was introduced to the West by Aleister Crowley. Cheers, y'all. <laughs> Let's see. Um, it says, she's buying a stairway to heaven. There's a sign on the wall, but she wants to be sure because she knows sometimes words have two meanings. All right, this, this, this reminds me of the what Crowley talked about in terms of esoteric and occult writing and the blind. Remember in our Alistair Crowley stream, we talked about um, how the... You know, Hermes Trismegistus and the the alchemists and the occultists will write occult, uh, you know, their, their books, their tomes, their 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 texts, and they will write them in such a way where you have to be initiated into the particular level or order to know where the red herrings go. Right. In other words, um, you have to know the keys, the, the you know, whatever it is, the, the keys to the Goetia or the keys of the, the Solomonic uh, keys in order to um, pass to the next level. Uh, there's a sign on the wall, obviously reminds me of, you know, the, the handwriting's on the wall, but it's sort of an inverted handwriting on the wall, right, from uh, David. And then it says, uh, there's a tree by the brook, there's a tree by the brook. There's a songbird who sings. Sometimes all of our thoughts are misgiven. Is this an Edenic image? Is this um, sort of, you know, I when I say like, is this the serpent tempting Eve? Or at least this is a view of that. I, I'm not throwing that out of nowhere. Later on in the song, we'll get the piper, right? And we'll get Pan. So we have this sort of forest of Arden, uh, pagan image of, you know, a land before time or a time before time, or um, which sort of ties into this idea of, you know, uh, uh, pre-fall, except for this is Eve being tempted and buying her way into wisdom, right? It says, it makes me wonder. It makes me wonder. There's a feeling I get when I look to the West and my spirit is crying for leaving. Okay, so looking to the West, 
I always took this as this is my interpretation. I always took this as, and I know there are multiple interpretations of the, you know, the Eastern star, but I always took this in sort of the revelation way of a book of revelation where it talks about like, you know, Christ is the, is the Eastern star, right? Rising, the sun rising. And that the West is sort of, my interpretation is like the sun is the sun going down and she wants to escape into the, into the spirits of the air. I'm going to get to that a little bit later in the song. Um, and sort of her familiar spirit. In my thoughts, I've seen rings of smoke through the trees and the voices of those who stand looking. Is this like ancestor worship? Now, look, I know that a literal interpretation of the song would just be, and that's fine, would be, this is a pastoral song, right? It's a pastoral, it's idyllic, and it's sort of, you know, going back to nature. And it's, it's important that we realize that the song um, came out of, you know, this sort of 60s age of Aquarius into the 70s. So, and Robert Plant, of course, was was fascinated with, and a lot of his lyrics, especially in the Battle of Evermore, which I might cover in a second, um, and ramble on, you know, these these Tolkien, these Tolkien uh, images um, from from The Hobbit and, um, and the Ring and the Fellowship of the Ring. But also, he was really interested in the Mabinogian and Arthurian quests, specifically dealing with uh, well, with with Wales, with Welsh myth, right? With Welsh uh, Celtic myth. Now, usually, what I do is I'll talk about, you know, how I don't care. I'm not interested in looking at the the life of the author or the life of the writer, right? As applied to the words on the page and the speaker, there's a disconnect, surely. But I think it's important when we discuss this. Uh, just to give us some sort of uh, context into the rest of the song. If it wasn't supported by the rest of the song, though, I don't think that I would be talking about it. Um, for those who stand looking, and the forests will echo with laughter. So this is like a return to nature, right? Now we get the we get the the famous intro, and we get if there's a bustle in your hedgerow, and of course the the man on the front of the the album looks like he's you know gathering wood um, for the hedgerow for building a hedgerow. Don't be alarmed now. It's just a spring clean for the May Queen, right? So we have this transcendence of nature and the cycles of the seasons. And the May Queen, who's the May Queen? Well, we've discussed the May Queen in relation to a couple of streams we've done. I mean, we've, dis we've discussed loosely the Wicker Man and uh, sort of Celtic vegetation rights and Robert Graves. And we've discussed um, the movie Men, right, which deals with this. Um, you can go to Jay's, of course, Jay's, go back and watch Jay's um, analysis of Midsummer, of Midsummer and um, of The Wicker Man, which clearly will, his clear, I mean, his analysis is so clear because he's discussing how the, the May Queen and these sort of, these, you know, Celtic and pagan rites um, all require human sacrifice in order to appease the gods of the earth, right? Um in the films. Um, it says, yes, there are two paths you can go by, but in the long run, and there's still time to change the road you're on. The two paths, well, you can't help but think of the, the are they, is he taking the left-hand path? Is this about the left-hand path? And it makes me wonder, he says, your head is humming, and it won't go. In case you don't know, there's a piper calling you to join him. All right, here we get the piper. Now, <laughs> we could read this as simply, you know, okay, we're in the forest and this is sort of a rustic setting or a medieval setting. And we get the Pied Piper calling the rats out of the city, right? Of course, if you're if he's trying to call you, then you're one of the rats. Yes. I think this deals with the the uh the Pan Piper, right? This is Pan. And Pan is, you know, Pan or Lucifer is essentially calling you to listen, right? and calling you to follow him. It says, and then it says, Dear lady, can you hear the wind blow? And did you know your stairway lies on the whispering wind? Now, I can't help but think of the Western wind. The Western wind, Western wind is one of the uh, first poems in English. It's the, I think it's the first English lyric poem. And uh, just, it goes, uh, Western wind, where wilt thou blow? The hard rain down can rain. Christ, if my love were in my arms and I in my bed again. So the song is about the song is about being at home with the the heavenly bridegroom, right? It's about salvation. 
Here, she is saying that the stairway is on the western wind, which is like, I can't help but think of the, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about the, the various spirits of the air and familiar spirits, and she wants to follow, you know, she, she wants to fly off. She's flighty. She wants to fly off and buy her stairway. Um, it says, and as we wind on down the road, Our shadows taller than our souls. I think it's pretty self-explanatory, right? Your shadow, your 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 other or your demon, as we discussed last night in the um, in the Antony and Cleopatra stream, right? We talked about how the the soothsayer tells Antony that um, he is more valorous, he's he's braver than Augustus, but he sees that. He, he sees, of course, a soothsayer um, or Tiresias. We've done the Oedipus Rex stream and we've done the Wasteland where Tiresias appears, this archetypal uh, uh, seer character from, uh, from the tarot deck and from Virgil's Aeneid, right? He can't physically see, right? He, this also appears in, in um, pagan ideology and religion and mythology where the seer can't physically see, but he can, he can spiritually see in a sense, I guess. And he sees... That Mark Antony's demon or spirit, right, or genie, is afraid of of Octavian's spirit, right? And this is saying our shadows, our spirits are taller than our souls, right? What you, what your subconscious, he's saying in in this, what you want is more than what your soul can achieve. But also, uh, let let yourself be your shadow self. In the in the song, it says there's a lady we all know. <clears throat> There's a lady we all know, is this Sophia, who shines white light and wants to show. Okay, so is that is that the Sophia principle? Is that Sophia? Is this a Gnostic Sophia? I mean, look, shining white light, only God shines white light, right? Only Christ and only the Trinity shines white light. This lady shining white light, this is a false white light. This seems to be like, is this the light of Lucifer? How everything still turns to gold and if you listen very hard, the tune will come to you at last. When all are one and one is all. Right? So we have this uh, unification with nature, right? This sort of pan principle, this unification with nature. And we have uh, going back uh, going back into nature and obeying the sort of the, the base laws of nature rather than the laws of God. And she's buying a stairway to heaven. Now, the interesting thing about this song is that it does what a lot of great songs do, which is that it has this, um, the song has a juxtaposition between what the words are saying and and our sort of remembrance of the song and the tune itself. Because the tune is somber, it's set, it's an epic song. It takes you on a progression. The reason that it starts off with just a guitar and then the vocals come in, and then the mellotron comes in, then the then the drums come in, and then we have the chorus, and then it, and it builds up into, frankly, the greatest guitar solo of all time. Right? It it is. It just is. It's the greatest guitar solo of all time, and it takes and it becomes epic, is because it's supposed to mimic the walking up the stairs. It's supposed to it's supposed to mimic the progression up the stairway to heaven, and <laughs> the juxtaposition between. The swelling scene, as Shakespeare calls it, right? The swelling scene and the the somberness of the vocals and really the tune of the guitar is interesting because it's both sad and happy, which is supposed to be kind of like the unification between the sky at the end of the stairway to heaven and the earth. And and what the song is really saying is that, you know, you find your, it could be both, you find your salvation according to the song, you know, on earth in temporal things or in, in a sort of a, I don't know, I think of like a temple of set sort of spiritual sense, right? Which is, is actually the stairway to hell. Does that make sense? At least that's my sort of thesis about the song. I don't know. What do you guys think? I mean, look, Led Zeppelin is amazing. They're, they're, they're one of the great bands of all time, but there's no denying that, they have this, right? And that Jimmy Page has a uh, occult, um, occult, uh, I mean, legitimately occult ties. And we're going to uh, dive into this book right here just a little bit and talk about some of the, some of the inspiration for the song, okay? So first of all, on page um, nine, this says, this says, um, 
Let's see. A soul already sufficiently blasted and damned. Yes, this says Paganini. Um, the greater skill of the musician, the higher the price paid for maintaining it. Consider the life of the Gen uh, Genoese violinist Paganini, uh, 1782 to 1840, whose career has been compared to Led Zeppelin's. Paganini was the first great virtuoso and superstar within modern memory. In an era when operatic singers were the only musicians to gain substantial acclaim and fortune in Europe, Paganini performed as an instrumental virtuoso in excelsis. Appearing at sold-out concerts in tight pants and very long hair, he caused women to scream and faint as he produced mysterious original effects on his violin. He invented the use of harmonics on the violin, perfected double and triple stops, and revived the ancient practice of scoradatura. 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 Listen, he perfected the scoradatura. The varied returning, a retuning of the strings. He was by far the richest musician of his era, but Paganini was also cursed by annoying rumors and infamous libels throughout his career. His fame was so wide and his power over his instrument and women so legendary that every European peasant knew for a fact that Paganini had sold his soul to the devil. He was accused in the press of being incurably dissipated and a maniacal gambler. It was said that he was selfish, cruel, morbid, and greedy. He is supposed in the popular imagination to have led a band of brigands and to have killed the husbands of his noble patronesses. In one contemporary account, Paganini secured his mastery over mankind and his preeminence in his art from the devil in exchange for a soul already sufficiently blasted and damned. Eyewitnesses in Italy soberly related having seen Satan guide Paganini's hands during a concert in Milan, while in France supposedly credible Creditable witnesses swore that they saw emissaries from hell driving away from the concert along a road that was not even there. And when Paganini died in France in 1840, the Catholic Church denied him burial in consecrated ground despite pleas from Rome because local peasants were too frightened. He remained unburied for three years until he was brought back to Italy. It's interesting because uh, Jimmy Page himself was obsessed with Paganini. And of course, Jimmy Page mimicked this with playing the guitar with the violin bow, if you don't know. So, so um, one of the things, yeah, and Jeff just dro dropped that great link about how Stairway came together. And I'm actually going to read um, his own account of that in just a second. Um, and one of the things uh, interesting about this you may not know is that if you've ever seen The Song Remains the Same, Jimmy Page in um, During Whole Lot of Love and Dazed and Confused plays the theremin, right? And Jay talked about the theremin before. The theremin was invented by, it was, it was made by this inventor who, had actually intelligence ties, and he, um, I think he was Russian, and he toured around the United States. Um, Tesla was was obsessed with the theremin, but he toured around the United States, and while he was there, of course, he was co-opted by intelligence so that he could spy on the various people whom he was playing the theremin to. And the theremin is that instrument that's like a stand-up, like, like antenna with a horizontal bar, and you play it by moving your hands uh, closer and further away like so that the frequency will make a musical sound, right? It's the sound that gave you the, the uh, intro to Star Trek, right? That, it's that sound. But Jimmy Page plays this um, on stage, and he, he played this during Song Remains the Same concert, and then what he does is he plays the violin, um, especially during Dazed and Confused, because of Paganini. And one thing you may not know is that when he strikes his guitar and holds his violin bow into the air, remember that he does it in four, at four points. He does it in four points to the, of the compass. And he is specifically there using his violin bow as a wand. It's a magic wand. This is a Crowleyan magic wand. And he's drawing the magic circle on stage and he is saluting the four winds, if you didn't know that. It's, that's from Crowley himself. I mean, from uh, Jimmy Page himself. Um... The devil appears as Mephistopheles with violin and bow in Goethe's Faust. We've, of course, done uh, Christopher Marlowe's Dr. Faustus. The devil's a fiddler in Charlie Daniels' The Devil Went Down to Georgia. It's an old image. Yes, of course. Um, if, you've seen, um, if you've seen the film The Witch, which I've talked about briefly here before, The Witch, uh, which, you know, it's that Netflix movie like 2015, right? V, V, Witch, arc spell, spell, spelled in an archaic fashion. Um, remember that at the end of the film, right, when she's gone through her ritual initiation and her trauma, and it's just, uh, she's the only one who survives with Black Philip the goat. Remember that she, 
sits down and hears the voice of Lucifer, and he says, he said, remember, he says to her, remove, remove thy shift. Remember that? She takes off her thing, and then he says, um, dust, he says, wouldst thou like the taste of butter? Right, remember that? And then he says, um, uh, write thy name in the book that appears, and of course, the book opens up, she sees the book, and it's, of course, it's not the book of life, it's the black book of death, and she says, uh, basically, I don't know how to write, and he says, I will guide thy hand. You remember that? And you'll notice that in that scene, you see in the background, it's very low light, and you see the, the goat's foot, the pan foot of Black Philip take one step, and you hear, what do you hear? You hear bells, right? And then you see it transform. The next foot is a booted foot with bells on it, and then you see him standing up, right? Because he's a shapeshifter, stands up, and he guides her hand writing in the Black Book of Death, and then she goes to a ritual, and Goya style floats in the air in that film. But the reason I bring that up is because the bells, the bells, 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 the Poe bells, are notoriously associated, and of course the violin, are notoriously associated with um, demons and with, for instance, with Paimon, with Paimon and the Princes of Hell. In April 1982, fuck these people, man, right? Excuse my language, folks. Okay, I know, it's dark stuff, but we're talking about it, and I'm not just throwing this out of nowhere. It's not just, it just seems like random shit that I'm throwing together. It just seems like that. And maybe maybe you think it is, and whatever, okay? Um, but I would say, I would say that um, these things are real. They are real. I, you know, of course, we don't believe in them. I don't believe in them, right? I believe in God, right? And put a put a boot up that devil's ass, right? And so, but they are they are real, uh, they are believable. And um, one of the reasons that I say that is because it's just like in films. If if this shit is just yes, it is theatrical and it's theatricality. And like you go to the concert and you see him doing all this stuff and it's theatricality. But if that's the case, why all this other stuff, right? Why did he buy Bolskin House? Why did he buy Equinox Press? Why does he collect Crowley shit? Why is he supposedly an OTO? Why does he own all of the old Crowley uh, texts? Why is he a major collector of this? And, and I'm not, look, again, it's like, okay, well, you can own books and it doesn't mean you believe them, of course. But buying solely Crowleyan and demonology and buying Bolskin House with the sole purpose of the fact that Bolskin House, when Jimmy Page bought it, he mentioned that it, 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 a church had been built on the grounds and then it had burned down and people died in it. And he liked that, right? Why, why buy Crowley's uh, estate in London? Why, why do all this stuff? Why, have, why get into this lifestyle, right? If this is just theatricality. In April 1982, a committee of the California State Assembly convened to listen, convened to listen to a Led Zeppelin record played backward. This is called backmasking. You guys know this, but this is called backmasking. Backmasking is essentially where, and, and Led Zeppelin didn't invent this. Um, I don't know who invented it. I know that it was rampant on um, uh, in uh, Sgt. Pepper, Magical Mystery Tour, you know, George Martin, uh, the producer, um, uh, sort of did this stuff. And backmasking is, is essentially recording a message uh, on the tape or on the, on the, on, in the recording device Play, when it's playing backwards, recording it, and then recording the song going forward. And then so when you play the song backwards, you hear you hear messages. Like, for instance, that's done specifically kind of as a LARP or ironically, like if you play Beck's song Loser backwards, it says, I'm a loser, baby, so why don't you kill me? It says it frontwards and backwards, right? But with Zeppelin, it's slightly different because you may know that uh, Stairway to Heaven, I'm sure a lot of people have listened to this, but when you play Stairway to Heaven backwards, of course, you hear the words... Uh, my sweet Satan, my towering Satan. And one of the things is that it sounds like a demonic voice. And I think it, you know, it, it probably is. Um, why is this a thing? Because remember that Aleister Crowley, who we've done streams on, Aleister Crowley said uh, that one of the methods for ritual initiation and, and the, and um, neuro-linguistic programming and, and for establishing the ritual or getting in contact with these entities is to invert everything, right? To invert order, to speak backwards. Um, it says, 
Irate Baptist preachers had complained that when Led Zeppelin records were played that way, satanic messages could be understood via an obscure recording process called backward masking or back masking, thus exposing upstanding American Christian youth to subliminal Satanism and devil worship. Sure enough, when the committee listened to Stairway to Heaven in reverse, some members said they could clearly hear the ominous, slurry, bone-chilling words, here's to my sweet Satan. And he offers no commentary on that. He says simply that they can hear that. And I think that that's probably the case. Remember, the satanic panic was real. Um, let's talk about the um, composition of Stairway to Heaven. Um, this is on page... 130 of this book again, Stephen Davis's Hammer of the Gods. Late 1970. Let's see. Oh, picture just fell out. It's an old book. Yeah, I first read this in yeah. 1994 is when I first read this book, you guys. Um, late 1970, Jimmy and Robert went back to the cottage at Bronrar to write new material. In Wales, they began to develop. That's where they recorded Led Zeppelin three. Uh, the introduction and Led Zeppelin 3, which is, of course, right here. Led Zeppelin 3. Right. Led Zeppelin 3. Um, says, in Wales, they began to develop the introduction and work out the separate sections of a new song, an anthem that would replace Dazed and Confused at Led Zeppelin's, as Led Zeppelin's centerpiece. In November, Jimmy dropped a hint of its existence to a music journalist in London. It's an idea for a really long track. You know, how dazed and confused with songs like that were broken into sections? Well, we want to try something new with organ and the acoustic guitar building up and building up. And then the electric parts start. It might be a 15-minute track. By the time Led Zeppelin began to record at Island Studio in Basing Street, London, in December 1970, Jimmy thought they might eventually end up with enough music for a double album. Part of Stairway to Heaven was recorded there with six-string intro that had been composed in Wales. But now it had mutated with the Christmas season from a rural madrigal to a song that was seasonal, uh, susticial, hymn-like. The group then decided to move rehearsals and recording to Headley Grange, the country house in Hampshire, preferring the laid-back life of the squire to the fluorescent basements of the London studio world. After a week of intensive living and playing together, the Rolling Stones' mobile studio would arrive and the new tracks would be cut. So, of course, um, they recorded at Headley Grange in uh, Hampshire, and they used ro the Rolling Stones. The Rolling Stones owned, a again, a mobile recording studio, basically in a truck, um, so they could record anywhere. And they, they, they pulled the truck right up to the front of Headley Grange, and then they ran wires into the various rooms in the house. This is an old, like, I think it's an old Tudor house. And this is famously where John Bonham, um, they put the microphones, like, at the base, at the foot of the stairs. And John Bonham played, like, in a bathroom. He played uh, ba um, when the, where the levee breaks, like, in a bathroom upstairs. And, of course, he played so loudly. And then, then, then that is what uh, ended up as the drum track that is like one of the most sampled drum tracks, especially in rap music, right? It's this heavy sound. After the equipment had been trucked out to the country, the band gradually filtered down to the dilapidated estate. Robert and Bonzo, John Bonham, would arrive together in one of Bonzo's 21 cars, maybe the Jensen, perhaps the Maserati, or the AC Cobra, the Rolls, or the Powder Blue Jaguar XKE. Jimmy and Peter would be driven down. John Paul Jones arrived last. They ate, according to Richard Cole, like Million Dollar Boy Scouts and drank like fish. Between rehearsals or sessions, they could shoot, take walks, or go into the village pub where Bonzo liked to hold court in his tweed jacket and cap. At night, the roadies or Cole built a fire and the guitars came out. One evening after Rolling Stones manager and boogie-woogie piano virtuous, virtuoso Ian Stewart had arrived with the Stones' mobile truck-mounted console recording studio, Jimmy and John Paul Jones finished and wrote down the chord changes to Stairway. The next day, the band ran down Stairway to Heaven for the first time. As the various sections, six, six string, 12 string solo, began to coalesce, the musicians again began to smile at each other. It was like that same magic with the first rehearsal. They knew they had something. Bonzo had problems with the timing on the 12 string section before the solo, and they had to run it through a few times before they got it the way Jimmy wanted it, because Jimmy Page produced it. <clears throat> While this was going on, Robert was listening and penciling in lyrics. He must have written three quarters of the lyrics on the spot, Jimmy said later. He didn't have to go away and think about them. Amazing, really. Okay, here we go with the lyrics, right, for Stairway. The lyrics for Stairway reflected Robert's current reading. The song tells in poetic forms, 
in poetic terms, of a mythographic lady's quest for spiritual perfection. That's just what we, that's what we just said, right? She is a paradigm of Spencer's fairy queen, Robert Graves' white goddess. We've, we just covered the white goddess. You guys remember that? We just did uh, Robert Graves' the white goddess when we did the men stream, the analysis of Alex Garland's men. And every other Celtic heroine, the Lady of the Lake, Morgan Le Fay, Diana of the Fields Green, Rhiannon in the Nightmare, Robert had been pouring through the works of the British antiquarian Lewis Spence. He later cited Spence's Magic Arts in Celtic Britain as one of the sources for the lyrics to Stairway. The title was already familiar to movie buffs as the title of a 1946 mystery starring William Powell. With its starkly pagan imagery of trees and brooks, pipers and the May Queen, shining white light and the forest echoing with laughter, Stairway to Heaven seemed like an invitation to abandon the new traditions and follow the old gods. It expressed an ineffable yearning for spiritual transformation deep in the hearts of the generation for which it was intended. In time, it became their anthem. Okay, so that's that's about uh, Stairway to Heaven. Now I'm going to talk about... Um, oh, here we go. Here's some more. This is page 150. Um, let's see. To a reporter, Jimmy said, I thought Stairway crystallized the essence of the band. It had everything there and showed the band at its best. It was a milestone for us. Every musician wants to do something of a lasting quality, something that will hold up for a long time. To another writer, Robert described the automatic nature of the lyrics. So automatic writing, um, let's talk about automatic writing for a second, you guys. Cheers to you guys. Thank you for being here on a little day stream talking about Zeppelin. Middle of the week. Thank y'all. Appreciate you. Don't forget, if you want to support me, drop some of them links, drop some of them uh, super chats, fat chats, and I appreciate you, especially if you want to do it after the stream's over. I really appreciate you. Support me, Venmo, PayPal, Cash App. Thank you so much. I'll give you shouts out. Or not if you don't want. Uh, says, oh, automatic writing. So automatic writing is the process of, this is kind of a Freudian technique, but it's actually an occult technique. This is a sort of, a, it's almost like a seance, but in writing. Uh, automatic writing was uh, especially done by um, James Joyce in Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, Ulysses, and Finnegan's Wake. And automatic writing is essentially something that came about in the, really came uh, into vogue in the early 20th century. What it means is that in a Freudian sense, it would be to let your, your, it would be to let your subconscious mind, or I guess maybe in a Jungian technique, would be to let your subconscious mind take over and to write. Now, of course, this seems like this, this comes from sort of a seance um, demoniacal method, right, of not letting your conscious mind write and letting something else inhabit you. Now, we see this all the time with musicians who are like, oh, I wrote the song. And um, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know I was writing it or they play, they, they feel like somebody else is playing the instruments or in the Stanislavski technique, right, in method acting to let something else take over your body and inhabit you. Now, we know that, you know, as far as like astral projection, all this stuff goes, it's like when you project your body, your mind and your soul somewhere else, you're letting it, you're leaving it empty for something else to fill it in. This is very dangerous. And Automatic writing is, the way it works is essentially that, like, let's say if you had a piece of paper and you had a pen and you were given a word, let's say the word is um, snow, okay? And what you do is you sort of turn off your mind and you start writing. And you, you don't think about what you're writing. You don't, you, there's no, you don't care about punctuation. You don't stop to, to edit. You don't stop to think. You simply keep writing. And let's say it's time. So you... You either write for two pages, you fill up two pages and you read back what you've gotten, or you can put it on a timer and write for a minute or five minutes straight. But when your hand gets tired from writing, you got to keep writing. That's what automatic writing essentially is in, in practical method. Now, writers will do this. Um, writers will do this with no like intent of doing anything dark because it's simply a way to spur ideas. So you're not going to put that in your book, right? But what you are going to do is look back and see if there's any ideas, any words that you use with, that you can use um, for, you know, the narrative or for the poem that you're writing. OK, however, I think that, you know, especially in the context of Robert Plant and what he's saying here, this is this is pure occultism. He says 
To another writer, Robert described the automatic nature of the lyric. I was just sitting there with Pagey in front of a fire at Headley Grange. Pagey had written the chords and played them for me. I was holding a paper and pencil, and for some reason, I was in a very bad mood. Then all of a sudden, my hand was writing out words. There's a lady who's sure all that glitters is gold, and she's buying a stairway to heaven. I just sat there and looked at the words, then I almost leaped out of my seat. <sighs> okay. Um, then I'm going to read some parts about um, Jimmy Page and Kenneth Anger. You guys know Kenneth Anger? Kenneth Anger is the uh, Satanist and filmmaker who made the film Lucifer Rising, and he tried to get Jimmy Page to do the soundtrack for Lucifer Rising. Jimmy Page reneged on the soundtrack, and eventually it was taken over by Bobby Beausoleil. Bobby Beausoleil, you may know, is one of the associates of uh, Chaz Manson, who is, um, I think, still in prison. And Kenneth Anger is also the guy who, in the 50s, went to uh, the Abbey at Telema um, in Sicily and filmed uh, Aleister Crowley's um, Abbey. He's also a, a OTO guy who holds, um, you know, rituals and sacrifices um you know, with fucking weird people, excuse my language, um, in, in, um, in LA, et cetera. And I think he's still alive, right? You can, you can see his conversation from not too long ago with, of all people, um, James Franco, who some say is the high priest of Satanism in, in LA, James Franco. And then again with, uh, Nicholas Winding Refn of Drive, who's too old to die young is again, a tarot OTO, um, television show. So let's see, it says, um, it says, that summer, page 272 in this, that summer, Jimmy was also attacked in the press by Kenneth Anger, who had finally grown tired of waiting for Jimmy to finish the Lucifer Rising soundtrack as promised. After several years, Jimmy had only managed to deliver 28, to deliver 28 minutes of music that Anger considered usable. There was no denying that the music was extraordinary, morbid, hypnotic, and utterly chilling. Related to No Quarter, Cashmere, and the later In the Evening, the soundtrack music was composed of drones and chants, flute-like melodies, and the wailing bowed guitar played through an early ARP synthesizer. The general effect was like a satanic mantra crackling with the thunder of clamorous feedback and the distant sound of faraway chimes. But it was only a fragment of what Anger had asked for, and in his anger, he went public. He accused Jimmy of sabotaging his film and implied that Jimmy was a heroin addict. Anger's major frustration, which he was, was that Jimmy was so isolated that it was impossible to communicate with him. I felt like my collaborator had died, Anger said. Not only were Jimmy's phone numbers a closely guarded swan song secret, but swan song itself was half shut down in exile with Peter Grant in Montreux. Swan song is the name of, of course, of Led Zeppelin's um, uh, private uh, record company that they formed, right? And why is it called swan song? It's called swan song because... <laughs> Kind of like with the, the Swan Theater, Shakespeare in Shakespeare's day, right? The Blackfriars, the Globe, and the Swan Theater. And the swan is a symbol of the poet because the swan is an animal that, that never, it, it never speaks. It never makes a noise. Um, but on its death, uh, the swan will sing the most beautiful song, right? But it's only in death. So, of course, Led Zeppelin named their, their company a Swan Song. And Swan Song also gave us the band um, Bad Company. Um, it says, Swan Song office in Chelsea even refused to take messages. <laughs> Excuse me. Callers were simply told to call back later. The selfishness and inconsideration were appalling, Anger says. This is coming from Kenneth Anger, right? And even when he spent time with Jimmy, uh, Page seemed so spaced out that Anger couldn't communicate. It was like rapping on an inch thin inch thick plate glass jimmy had more or less turned into an undisciplined rich dilettante at least as far as magic and any s serious belief in alistair crowley's work was concerned anger felt that jimmy was a prime example of magic gone haywire half understood not under will right of course under will because love is the law love under will right this the thelema and oto he remarked that alistair crowley had been a heavy user of both heroin and cocaine but that crowley could handle it because of his robust mountaineer's physique Jimmy Page appeared wasted. He couldn't handle it. In interviews, Jimmy counterattacked, seeming wounded and righteous. He explained that he had offered Anger an editing table and space to work in and claimed he had been waiting for Anger to finish, not the other way around. But Anger's published claim that Jimmy was having an affair with the white lady, capitalized white lady, right, um, 
heroin and cocaine, what well, China White, implied that Jimmy was using heroin and that this was the cause of his malaise. Um, let's see. There was also a problem with Jimmy. Let's see. In September, Jimmy and Bonzo were in Montreux where they recorded a solo drum track that Jimmy intended to treat with synthetic distortion and use in some future Led Zeppelin album. Then Jimmy flew back to England to counter the anger problem and be with Charlotte, who had taken very ill. There was also the problem of evicting friends from Tower House. Tower House was his house, I think, in outside of London. Um, was that the one that was also owned by Crowley? A couple who were suffering from delusions that they had become Jimmy and Charlotte. Maybe they had. Maybe they'd been doing rituals, right? Maybe this was their shadow selves, right? Their shadows taller than their souls. The vibes at Tower House were always strange, and they seemed to be at all of Jimmy's residences. At Bolskin, which had now been redecorated by a renowned Satanist named Charles Pierce, a caretaker had committed suicide, and in another had gone mad and been taken away to the hospital. Oh, okay. Um, okay, then they, let's see, they talk about the mafia. Um... Let me just read this part, because this is about the mafia here, Richard Cole. Now, if you know Jimmy's, continued Cole, you got Onassis and Saudis and all of them down there. You got these rich fucking Turks and the mafia and the fucking heavy Corsicans, and all these wealthy guys have got guys with guns with them. Now you imagine some long hair in a white suit standing up and pulling a gun out. The whole place is going to fucking go bananas, and someone's going to get shot to death for no reason. Um, and this is one of their guys... Uh, the, their guy Hinton, this guy Hinton, pulled a gun on Richard Cole. Um, and so, yeah, so all their guys were carrying guns at this point. Um, and these were mafia guys, all their, all their bodyguards, etc. All right, so let's skip to page 309 because it's about stairway again. You guys having fun? Is this good? What are y'all saying? Shouts out to Jethro, Jason, Crispy, Nate, um, Kristen, Slowboy Whiteboard. Shouts out to Jerry at Exposing Powerful Lies, Ellie, former ghost, um, Altior. Shouts out to Smiling Conqueror, um, Countess. Shouts out to everybody out there. Appreciate y'all. By mid-1982, two years after the dissolution of the band, uh, Led Zeppelin was still managing to generate public controversy. Stairway to Heaven now more than 10 years old, was still the most requested song on American FM stations, and this began to bother a group of Baptist preachers in the South and Southwest. One prominent Baptist used his radio pulpit to preach that Stairway to Heaven carried subliminal satanic messages. On a nationally syndicated Sunday morning broadcast, he played two versions of Stairway. The first was a normal speed and sounded like what every healthy American teenager considered his uh, personal hymn. The second version was played at a much slower speed, and the words, Here's to my sweet Satan, could be faintly discerned. Uh, well, that was actually back, backward. It was a back mask. Um, at the end of the song, the same spooky voice seemed to say, it's going to snow. The preacher claimed this as proof that the rock music was a vehicle for the Antichrist. And in April 1982, a committee of the California State Assembly played a backward tape of Stairway to Heaven in the belief that subliminal devil worship had gra been grafted into the record via a process called backward masking. Some members of the committee claimed they could clearly he hear the words, I live for Satan, when they heard Stairway played backward. Led Zeppelin was duly denounced as agents of the devil, uh, luring millions of kids into damnation as unwitting disciples of the Antichrist and the forces of darkness. Um, let's see. Okay, and then I'm just going to read one more part from this book. And that is... Jimmy Page. No, let me go to the other book. This is Richard Cole. This is Richard Cole's Stairway to Heaven. This is a good book. It's really enjoyable. It's a great book. Um, if you're a fan of Zeppelin or just music or just you want to know about the lyrics or the, or the band, it's a pretty good book um, because he talks about some things different from the other book. Um, for instance, he says um, on page, let's see, 141... He says, Jimmy was so thoroughly impressed with Robert's lyrics on Stairway that he decided to take a hiatus from lyric writing himself. It's not that hard a decision, he thought. Robert has grown so much as a songwriter. 
Pagey told Robert that the band had a new consummate writer of lyrics. I, I'll defer to your talents for now, because Jimmy Page wrote all the music before that. Um, as Jimmy spent more time in the studio, he became obsessive about each song on the new album and how it might be improved. He listened to individual moments and individual songs and then the entire product as a whole. It's page 141. While piercing, uh, piecing together the folk-oriented Battle of Evermore, the Battle of Evermore, um, which I mentioned before, is on the Four album and is a purely um, Tolkien, uh, Tolkien, Tolkien-esque song. Right, the drums will shake the castle walls. The ring raids ride in black. It's uh, about the battle for, I don't know, whatever it is, and the return of the king. Um, let's see. Robert felt that another voice was needed to give richness to it. Finally, he suggested inviting Sandy Denny to sing on it with him. Denny, the soprano voice with Fairport Convention, figured Robert was kidding when she received the SOS from Plant. Zeppelin, after all, had a reputation for being a closed shop, with other musicians rarely invited to participate in either recording sessions or live performances, which is unusual. Remember that the Wrecking Crew and all these guys, I mean, you know, even on the Doors albums, um, you know, the, the Doors were, a, were also an insular band, but on L.A. Woman, they had Jerry Sheff um, play bass, you know, from the Elvis uh, band. And Led Zeppelin was unusual that they recorded, produced, wrote, all of their music and all their own songs. Um, says, uh, Robert convinced her that this was real. Sandy sang counterpoint to Robert like a town crier representing the voice of the people, supported by a rich blend of acoustic guitars and mandolin. Um, Led Zeppelin IV had, doesn't have their name anywhere on it. Um, let's see. If you look at, yeah, if you look at the album, it's interesting because they sent the album out. It's kind of like Kanye's Yeezus, I guess, is a, is a good analogy. Years later, I mean, there's nowhere nowhere on it does it say Led Zeppelin, right? Nowhere. Look, there's not even any songs listed. It's just this. And that was a bold statement because it was made, you know, Peter Grant sent it out, and then eventually the record company, Atlantic Records, and uh, Amit Erdogan, uh, made them package the album in a brown paper bag, that had uh, the four symbols on it, which is where you get the four symbols. Um, but it still didn't say Led Zeppelin. And then, you know, and then the record store was like, okay, we got to put Led Zeppelin's name on this somewhere. But obviously the purpose was this, you know, it's, um, it's sort of this uh, hubristic statement, right? Where we can do anything we want. Everybody's going to know us even with no name. Right, disappearance of the ego, I guess, or whatever. Um, even though it's, it's fraudulent because they're pure ego, but all right. So it says, let's see, um, let's skip to, oh yeah. Okay. So this is on page 152 says Bonzo returning to the hotel was, we convinced a few girls to come back with us. We were all so drunk that we had trouble finding our own rooms and ended up in Tony Smith's room, where we continued drinking from the bottles that I had smuggled out of the club. Jimmy took one of the girls into the bathroom, and we heard the bathtub water running again. Jimmy's getting kinky again, Plant said. A few minutes later, I began smelling smoke coming from the bathroom. What the hell's going on, I said, peeking in and noticing that Jimmy had somehow started a fire in the middle of the sink with newspapers and towels. I shouted for some help from the other room. Robert frantically ran into the hallway and broke the glass on the fire extinguisher case, which activated the fire alarm. He sprayed, smothered, and successfully doused the flames just as the night manager burst through the door. Holy shit, he exclaimed. What are you bastards doing? Robert thought a lot faster than the rest of us. It's a religious rite, he said calmly. My friend here is a very devout, ma devout man, very spiritual. He was reciting a prayer using the ancient rituals of his ancestors. It was a moving ceremony. Jimmy looked a little embarrassed. Yeah, I'm sorry if I caused a disturbance. Um, incidentally, we never did find out what Jimmy's bathroom conflagration was all about because it was, probably was an actual ritual. Of course, there was his growing preoccupation with the occult. Perhaps the fire was somehow related to it. When I asked him about it, all he said was, I liked Percy's explanation best. Let's just say it was an ancient rite that went up in flames. Okay. Um, let's see. Then they start talking about this whole chapter is called heroin. 
uh, because the band was deeply into drugs. John Bonham actually started doing heroin because when they were in Japan, they bought these samurai swords, and then somebody laid out some drugs. He thought it was cocaine. It ended up being heroin. Then he got addicted to it. And, of course, Jimmy Page, like Aleister Crowley, used heroin probably as part of his um, his so-called religious rites. His, I mean, they, they were religion in a sense, right? I mean, he just worshipped with Satan. Um, let's see. Okay, page 195 says, I always felt that more than the others, Jimmy was much too complex an individual to be living for music alone. I knew that his dabbling in the occult continued. Although I still kept that side of his life, uh, he still kept that li side of his life very private. On occasions, he would mention the name Aleister Crowley to me. Crowley had been a part poet, part magician, part mountain climber who conducted rituals and black magic, many at his satanic temple on Fulham Road. Crowley had been a real mystery to people. I occasionally became Jimmy's unofficial chauffeur on some of his Crowley shopping sprees. Despite Pagey's love of automobiles, over the years, he owned cars like a Bentley, an Austin Champ, Army Jeep, a Cord Sportsman, and an old Mercedes with running boards. He never had a driver's license. I just never bought. I just never bothered to get one. He said. So several times he would call me and say, "Richard, I'm in the mood to go shopping for some Crowley artifacts." We drive from auction houses to rare book showrooms where Jimmy would buy Crowley manuscripts or other belongings: hats, paintings, clothes. What is it about this chap Crowley that fascinates you? I asked Jimmy on one of our outings. The guy was really quite remarkable, Jimmy said. Someday we'll talk about it, Richard. Someday. Of course, he's not going to talk about it with him now. Uh, but we never did, he says. If the public felt there was a certain mystery surrounding Led Zeppelin, they weren't alone. As close as I was to them, I sometimes felt there was something within Jimmy he never let anyone see, particularly when it came to his preoccupation with Crowley, seances, and black magic. I had a lot of unanswered questions. This is Richard Cole. He was with them every day. Um, let's see. They, uh, John Paul Jones, I mean, um, uh, John Bonham, um, did a fake seance. So-called fake seance. Oh yeah, here it is on page uh, 290. Um, let's see. It says, let's stage our own seance, Bonzo suggested. Now this is close to John, John Bonham's death. Remember John Bonham died after drinking 40 black Russians, probably a heroin overdose. Um, but, um, and then people claim that, um, his death was a blood sacrifice, right? Says, and, you know, may have been so. Remember Robert Plant's, um, young son, his like five-year-old son, Carrick died, um, at the start of their, really when they got huge. Um, very weird. Uh, Jimmy isn't the only one who can get into this supernatural bullshit. Jimmy was deeper into Aleister Crowley than ever. He had even opened up a bookstore in London that dealt exclusively with the occult. In general, those interests, however, odd they seemed, weren't that big a deal for the rest of us, since Pagey still never tried to brainwash us with his own beliefs. But he, he but because he, we occasionally heard stories from Led Zeppelin uh, that they were jinxed band, they weren't something we could completely ignore either. I decided to get back at Jimmy. Let's have a little fun with Pagey, I said. This is Richard Cole again. Um... In fact, I'd like to scare the shit out of him. Uh, Jimmy's suite adjoined Bonham's, and the door behind them was slightly ajar. I dimmed the lights, and within earshot of Jimmy, we began chanting as loudly as possible. Um, we had linked hands and closed our eyes. Fighting back laughter, we readied ourselves to communicate with the spirits. Bonzo whispered, this stuff really is crap. Through squinted eyes, I finally saw Jimmy walking toward us, with Peter a step behind. As they moved closer, Linda gently pushed the lever with her knee table began to rise. Jimmy and Peter were startled. Jimmy flinched and took a step backwards. Both had expressions that seemed to say it's a fucking miracle. The table dipped and then rose two more times. Peter must have finally gotten suspicious. He walked over and flipped on the light switch. With the room fully illuminated, he got down on his hands and knees and spotted the lever. Neither here, neither he nor Jimmy seemed to find it very funny. And then finally, um, let's see. Okay, this is page 295. Um, during a, this is after John Bonham threw Keith Moon in the pool. Um, he, it was George Harrison. He threw one of them in the pool. John Bonham and Keith Moon became good friends. And then, of course, Keith Moon died. Um, I think he died in 1980 also. John Bonham died in 1980. Um, but uh, they threw, I think they threw George Harrison in the pool at a party. During a three-week break to the U.S., in the U.S. tour, most of us flew back to London. 
But Jimmy planned to jet to Cairo with Mick Hinton, apparently to do some Aleister Crowley-related Egyptology research. On his flight home, Bonzo said to me, do you know the reason Jimmy is taking Mick and not you to Egypt? He knows that if he decides to sacrifice someone, he'd find it a lot harder to do away with you than Mick. There you go. That's Led Zeppelin, you guys. Literal talk of sacrifices. Interesting. Um, and Zeppelin actually, they, they actually, the first time they played um, Stairway to Heaven was in uh, Belfast. Did you know that? <clears throat> they played it in Northern Ireland at the Ulster Hall. And uh, it was in the middle of the Troubles, and there was actually a riot, and they had to escape. Uh, they had to do that a number of times in a number of places over the years. They had to do it in Italy a few times. Um, but a petrol tanker was hijacked, and a youth was shot dead, and firebombs were hurled the night Led Zeppelin came to town. Um, let's see. Some of the production of the song... Um, says curiously a phrase this is page 60 <laughs> page 66 let me confirm in this book about Led Zeppelin lyrics curiously a phrase similar to Zeppelin's appears on Skip Softly My Moonbeams a track on the 1968 Pro Call Harem album Shine On Brightly um, the stairs to heaven lead straight down to hell are the original lyrics However, Reed does not believe there's any connection with Led Zeppelin. Um, let's see. Page, for Page, it remains a magical piece of work. Uh, and that's buying the stairway, right? Is, which is what we said earlier. Um, a flowing melody, which he would only play as an instrumental when he returned as a solo artist after the demise of Zeppelin. Um, there was always a huge demand for the song. But Page says... They tried everything to convince us it should come out as a single, but we just said no. It would have destroyed the whole feel of the album. That's interesting, right? That's, that it was never released as a single. Uh, Page called it a glittering thing. A glittering thing. After the band had finished their March 1971 Ireland, um, Northern Ireland dates, they went on to a small venue trip around England. Um, and they played the song and achieved a new kind of intimacy. And let's see, was I, let's see. And that's about it. That's about it. So that's Led Zeppelin, you guys. That's our Stairway to Heaven Led Zeppelin stream. What'd you guys think of that? Was that interesting? You guys like that? Uh, show you a couple other things here. This is the, I just happen to have all this stuff, you guys. Um, this is the Song Remains the Same uh, re-released box set with the four symbols there. Now, you can see the four symbols. Now, the, these are sigils. They're not just four symbols. They're sigils. This is obviously Robert Plant because it's the feather in the circle, the magic circle, because he's, he's writing the song. Um, this right here is uh, Jimmy Page's Zoso, which is, uh, I think it's found in a book of, Probably found in uh, King James's demonology book from like 1547, but it's just a it's a sigil. It's another demonic sigil. Of course, we have John Bonham's three rings here resembling drums, and also he chose that because it uh, was um, what was it? Valentine beer? I forget the name of the beer. It's still you can still get it. Um, Valentine beer, um, and then of course John Paul Jones, right, which has. The Celtic Trinity symbol. Now, John Paul Jones is the only member of the band who seems to have been exempt from any of their ceremonies and rituals and their sacrifices. Um, he was notoriously, um, to them, absent from a lot of that stuff and refused to participate. So maybe that's why he chose that symbol, right? Um, the is pretty cool. I mean, the inside of the book there and it comes with all this stuff and most most famously this this is the sequence in the song remain, in the um, song remains the same during stairway to ha i mean um days and confused where jimmy page climbs the rock actually the sequence in the film where 
Jimmy Page climbs the craggly rocks up to the top and he meets himself in the guise of the old man as the tarot wizard who then shines his violin bow, uh, his violin bow, peacock, Satan, rainbow sword, right, with the lamp of illumination for his OTO ritual was filmed at Bolskin House, was filmed at Crowley's old estate, if you didn't know that. Um in Scotland on the shores of Loch Ness. And then here's the um, UK version of the Song Remains the Same, which I got um, when it was released when I lived over there. And it's much tamer. It's uh, However, what is that? What is that on the cover, you guys? Isn't that the Devil's Rock? Right? Isn't that the Devil's Rock in the desert? And that's just the inside. Right? All dunes. Of course, you may remember from the 90s when they came out with the box set and it had the uh, the the fake and gray uh, alien symbols drawn, the crop circles. Of course, those are just, you know, it's a psyop with, with sigils. Um, and then here is the Led Zeppelin complete box set uh, from the 90s, right, with the inside of the actual Zeppelin. And it's interesting that they're named Zeppelin, Led Zeppelin, because they were named by Keith Moon. Keith Moon said this band's going to go down like a Led Zeppelin right, like the Hindenburg. Um, and that's where they were, they were going, going down. Uh, but anyway, it's got all of the remastered uh, CDs. Um, and then a couple other things. Here are just the records. This is Led Zeppelin II. And of course, they are the crew. They, they've been Photoshopped, face swapped in for the crew of the original Hindenburg, right? Led Zeppelin too. And here they are with the gold golden idol right in front of the temple. Um, here's the original Song Remains the Same record from the 70s with the Swan Song label. Right? Um, here is uh, Led Zeppelin three. With, it's even got, it's even got the pullout, so you can, can't really spin it, but there's a little thing here, and you spin it, and it's got like a, it's got kaleidoscopic images on the inside, including monarch butterflies, Led Zeppelins, etc. Here's their first album, Led Zeppelin. Here's uh, another original, um, their album three. And then here's another copy of uh, two. So anyway, um, so that's Led Zeppelin, you guys. What do you think of that? Was that cool? Was that a good stream? Did we uh, did we get any? Did we get any? Let's see. Oh, Christian wrote me an email. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, did we get any super chats? Okay, we didn't get any super chats this time. But you know what, you guys? It's a Weekday, it's uh, July 6th, right? Wednesday afternoon. And I really just appreciate you guys being here. And of course, got a lot going on today. We'll be here again at 6 p.m. for um, the stream on Belly of an Architect with West Lexicon Media, Sole Purpose ACR. And JD will be streaming tonight. Oh, oh TGF, Green Feathers. We'll be doing a live painting stream at 8.30, and then we've got uh, JD at 9 o'clock after that doing the Elvis stream. So a lot going on today, you guys. Thank you so much. I really appreciate y'all being here. I hope you found this enjoyable. I think that the next um, music stream, will it'll probably be a lot shorter, um, but we'll probably do, um, we've got a bunch of things lined up. I want to do David Bowie's uh, Black Star and Station to Station, talk about, the, talk about how Station to Station is a Kabbalah song. Uh... We've also, we're also going to do some lighter songs and some pop songs. We'll probably do some Britney Spears, right? I mean, why not? And talk about some of the uh, deeper meaning of those songs. We're also going to do um, Pumped Up Kicks by um, uh, we Foster the People, which is, well, you can look up what that song is about or just wait till we do the stream on it, right? Uh, maybe do Little Dark Age by MGMT. I'm probably going to do one by Metallica. I need to read uh, Trumbo's book, Johnny Get Your Gun, and do uh, one stream by Metallica. I think that would be cool to do. And if you've got any suggestions for songs, please write them in. That's what I really need. Um, 
besides your super chats, <laughs> is if you've got suggestions for song lyrics that you want me to look at and analyze and go in depth into, um, send me some songs, put them in the, in the, in the comments after the video is over. And yeah, it takes a, it takes like a long time for the, for the chat to replay, for the video to render and for the chat to replay. So it doesn't replay right away. So put them in the comments afterwards in the video. Um, I would love to see you guys suggestions, especially those of you that are like, you know, highly musical. Um, Jeff has made some great suggestions for some Rush songs. I think that'd be cool. Um, you know, I can do some rap songs, whatever you want me to do. Uh, let me know, put it in the, in the description and, uh, please support me. Um, thank you again for supporting me. You guys, everybody who supported me and who constantly supports me. I thank you so much. You guys are amazing. And, uh, please think about supporting your boy here so I can uh, keep putting out some good content, you know, some, or some content that you enjoy. Right. So that's about it. You guys, I really appreciate y'all. I love you. I hope everybody has a wonderful afternoon. And yes, he's, um, Jess says, Jason, now you're talking. Yeah. I'll have to go back and see what you said, Jason. Um, so thank you so much, you guys. I appreciate you. I love you. And I will see you later. Peace.